Go ahead, Juan. <laughs> Juan, you're going to give us an update. Jeff, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? No, yes, we can, Juan. Oh, okay. So, uh, I, the, the, my last updates are like this. Uh, as I was telling you, I was working heavy in the documentation there on the wiki. Uh, and it, as, I, as I couldn't go further with the navigation in the, in the robot, I was working in another robot, a, a smaller one, uh, because there I got the support of the community here. It's a little robot. We've lost you again, Juan. Juan, your connection's really bad. Okay, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. No, it, I have an incoming call from, from my wife in the phone, so I can't talk. Uh, it, it, the, the, that is very similar to the turtle robot, and the, um, I have a lot of support of the community in Spanish because it's, it's, a, it's a robot that we are working to try to get support from... Uh, to uh, to schools to give support for schools uh, for teaching ROS. Uh, um, that robot have uh, something similar uh, uh, to my robot is because uh, it run over all all completely over Docker. Uh, <clears throat> it's a very similar setup uh, to the one that we have. We have a Raspberry with a ROS serial controlling, a, they have three different setups. It's like a, a EST32 a EST board and a, a, a TNC board, and others have an ESP32 board. A, both, a, they, they, we are working in the three setups at the same time. I have some problems with the guy that is designing the, uh, we are trying to build a, a, I don't know how to explain it, but an integrated car where you can put all the components there. And it's the same uh, car that we are using for the, 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 the Powerland robots, the, the agro robots, it's very similar um, because it has the, mainly the same component. And, uh, and let me think if there is something more. Uh, ah, and we are working in, at the same time in the simulator with the gazebo and the and the robot. So the, the robot when it will uh, it will come out will go with the the the, the all, all the parts uh, together. The simulator and the and the robot itself. The, simulator, the simulator is already uh, been done uh, in Gazebo, and I think that the robot is it's okay. It's already been done, but I couldn't build it up uh, together because I have some problems uh, with some parts that I couldn't uh, get well done uh, in the 3D printers uh, because I was missing the, the wheels but it was uh, I mean, uh, it, was, it was my mistake because I didn't find it in the, in the repository in GitHub. Um, so mainly now we are working in a board where we can put all the components there. Uh, the board is uh, designed for the ESP32 uh, and we use the, the Ublox GPS and the I don't know if there is another sensors that are similar. Uh, 
And yes, and we use the driver that we use for the for the uh, for the actuator in the in the robot, in the agricultural robot. Are you installing MoveBase Plus in your um, set of packages? Yes, it's all with MoveBase Plus. The, the main difference is that they don't uh, they, they 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 don't use Ubuntu for the system in the Raspberry. They use Raspbian, faster Raspbian, and there they install the the Docker file uh, that runs the 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 ROS software. And are you doing um, melodic, kinetic, or which right. um, this is a very it's the first time that i'm using noetic this this is all in noetic and so ubuntu 20. yeah uh, no 18. 1804 i i'm i'm, I'm not sure this, but i think it's 1804 because the other way we the other day we were discussing uh, discussing this and, and i don't remember what we of what will come up, but I think that it was 1804. Mm, I don't know the versions well enough. I th I was thinking Noetic was, I, th I thought Melodic was 18 and Noetic was 20. Mm. Not sure. Sometimes, well, there's, sometimes there's an overlap in there where one version will run on Two different versions of Ubuntu, so maybe that's what. But you're definitely going to. But you're definitely yeah. going to use MoveBase Plus. Yes, the main thing is that uh, there is a lot of people working this project, and I will get a lot of. Uh, I I hope I hope I hope that I will get a lot of support for this, uh, so I will be able to push others. Uh, items that we have in the discussion, uh, but I'm not sure how this will end uh, because uh, it's a, a lot of there are a lot of people in the uh, in the team. Um, some people works a lot, uh, but for example, the, the the guy that is trying to build up the the, the board. He's a teacher, and teachers have a lot of work now with the pandemic. Uh, so we are, I think that we are, uh, I don't know how we will solve that. I, it, it's very demanding because you need a, a really, a very good uh, electrical engineer to design that, and he's a very good one. And I, I don't know how we will uh, overcome that because the other guys are all software guys. Uh, we will see how we solve it. In the simulator, are you simulating a GPS signal? Yes, yes, it's complete, the, the simulator. As I understand, it's complete. The other day, I had a little problems when I was trying it because uh, the thing that I was telling you that was not edited, and I, I wasn't able to, to test it a lot, uh, but, uh, yes, it's the complete uh, setup. And in the simulator, how do you, how do you, what what sensor is producing your ODOM um, uh, calculation? Uh, because uh, in the, the robot, uh, odometries uh, come from the motors. And it's uh, track steering or Ackerman steering? No, oh, it's Ackerman. Ackerman steering. Yes. Wow. No, 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 sorry. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, the other one, no Ackerman. Because Ackerman is like car. No. Uh, the other one, uh, it got the, the, the crazy wheel on. The one wheel. It's a free wheel robot. 
so track steering with a GPS, sensors on the tracks producing an ODOM statement. Yes, and the motors, because the, mo the motors got the, the other data of the wheels. Eso es hijo, ¿cómo anda suite? Estoy hablando por teléfono. Do you know if they've thought through, will the ODOM position be updated at all with the GPS signal? No, I, I'm not sure about that because I got to do more, more testing. Uh, I got, I, I have done the, the basic test, uh, the testing that was involved in sending some common velocity. Uh, statement to through the terminal the, and I stopped there but uh, the, the, the thing is that the the team that is working in this is very suitable to do the, the change and the as, as they are relying relying on me to build the documentation the I think that they will get them done what would be interesting to see that I've not learned or or seen is how to simulate GPS in the simulator. Well, that uh, but that's well documented. The problem was that I when I have done that, I broken my my I broke my my gazebo setup because. Uh, there is a tutorial for doing that. You have to give the the, the gazebo a fake uh, GPS uh, point, uh, and then over there uh, you give the coordinates to the robot. I was able to do that. I I, I don't know now uh, if I can get it again working, but. Uh, because I didn't come back to, to, to that, but you can you can fake that. Who developed the URDF, and is there a three D model of the robot? Uh, it's the same guy that uh, built all the the Docker files. I'm not sure about the he, he had done the the Docker file that is in the robot because the robot, as my robot, runs the Docker file. Uh, not a complete, uh, an independent configuration of ROS. Uh, it's a configuration that is in the, in the Docker file that is bring up by the, the Baxter Raspbian. I, I, I never done that, and I, ne uh, and I didn't uh, go so far in the building of the robot uh, because uh, I didn't understand that way. I understand that I, were, I need to, uh, I needed to, to download the, uh, an Ubuntu file, and I was wrong. So that was, uh, that, uh, I, I understand that I was wrong yesterday. So I'm, I'm new. I, I got to download Baxter. I, I, I didn't know that Baxter, Raspi and Baxter could run Docker. Mm. Neat. It would be interesting to see the uh, the URDF or the three D if, if they have a three D a three D model of the of the robot to see but if they that, start. That's easy. To, that's easy to show you. Uh, now I cannot because I'm I'm in, I'm in the car. But uh, I will I I will try for next week. To, to boot up the the Raspbian with the with the with the data and and upload the the, the file. Are they using Arviz to simulate or Gazebo? Uh, they are using Arviz. Well, it sounds like an interest, an interesting project. I think that the, the most important thing is 
that there are uh, five to six guys working the project, uh, and and the idea to bring more people to, go, uh, to the project, and I will be able to to ask better questions to them <laughs> and learn more uh, about the setups. Uh, I, I, that's the most encouraging thing uh, for this, because I will try to apply the documentation of ROS over the over the robot, the services, the topics, the, all the things that the, the, the packages, all that thing over the the ROS uh, documentation and this robot. Um, I think that maybe it could move me forward. Uh, understanding better the, how the system works and how, how to how to migrate from the from the Airbus and the simulators to the to the real robot and backward. Definitely. Juan, anything else to mention? No, uh, no. Uh, sorry, I, I can. I was unable to, to 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 try to translate some of the things that I'm trying to explain to, to say in better English, but uh, I think that now that I'm starting to work again, I will be able to bring the community more more about that. That's great. Welcome back. Happy to thank have you back. Thank you. Thank you for thank you and uh, thank you, Jen. Jeff, you've got two screens going. You must have something to share. Well, well, we'll see what happens here. I, I, I went through the process to start this up, and it says, "Oh, just a minute." Firefox has to restart, so that took another, another two minutes for it to do that. So we'll, we'll see what happens here. Let's. Uh, but since I, since I'm at this point, I'll go ahead and talk about this if I can get this to work. Come on. Now well, it doesn't doesn't look like it wants to work. I click on share screen and it does nothing. So maybe maybe I won't do that. Why won't that work? Share screen. Well, we we won't do that. We'll talk about something else here. Well, at least tell us what you're going to show. Okay, let me let me try to remember what I was going to do here. So I a couple of weeks ago, I went out and um, I kept thinking that I need to fix my odometry, you know, figure out how to get it right, as opposed to just poking at it every time. So I went out and I, I got my air tank and my pressure gauge and put 30 psi in both back tires of the robot, took it out and drove around the block two times. And originally I had a uh, plot so, so several weeks ago, what I've been running the whole time, I, I, I would get a odometry plot drive around the block that would be, it would look kind of like a rectangle, but it was opened up. So it would spiral out to, to generate this uh, curve. And then I, I went back and looked at the Ross agriculture meetings when I was talking about how do you calibrate this? And I took the numbers off the screen there and programmed them into the robot and drove it around and it was closer to where it should be, but it still wasn't correct. So this time I put the air in the tires first, drove around two times and came back and looked at my odometry. Now it looks like a clover leaf. So it, it drastically changed the thing. And that's because as I put air in my back tires, I think I checked one had like 10 PSI and one had 20 PSI that I've been running most of the time. So when you put air in the tire, number one, the tire, the tire expands out because it's got more pressure in it. The other thing is the, the surface of the tire, as you put more air in the, the, you know, the surface of the tire becomes more of a, more, more rounded. So, so your contact point is, is closer to the center of the tire. And if your tire is, is flat like this, you don't know if the contact points could be here or here or over here. So that's another thing that it, it made the difference on. And the fact that both of them have the same amount of air, I should be able to calibrate to that and make it, make it actually work. So after, after I did that, I saw it was a clover leaf on the screen when I plotted it. So I extracted all the numbers, went back to my Excel and played with it for a while. And I can get it to come out fairly close where I can get two, two overlapping rectangles that 
are, are close enough to where they need to be. So I just need to go back and, and prove that I can run that again to verify that the next time I run it with that amount of air in my tires and with the correct numbers in that it will give me will give me what I want. So that that's kind of the uh, that's one of the things I was going to show you. Uh, the other thing is the fact that I drove around twice and I've got the what I was going to show you over here that I can't. I, I had the uh, a plot of the of the RTK of latitude and longitude driving around twice and it all looks looks good. And then I have the plot of that converted to offset in meters and that all looks good. And what was the next screen? So the next screen was showing you that clover leaf pattern that really looks bad. So then the next one. Uh, also, before I ran at that time, I decided that I wanted to uh, get rid of this stuff with a, uh, let's see if I can pull up a picture here on this computer. Uh, no, I don't have it on this computer, but I have the problem where, you know, I, I do the, uh, I do the heading and if it's close to zero, you know, just a little bit of noise jumping between zero and 360 makes it bang back and forth and you can't tell what it's actually doing. So I went into the code. <laughs> So I, I went into the code for both the IMU and the uh, the uh, GPS static heading, and I unwrapped the heading. So I, when it gets to close to zero, if it tries to go below zero, instead of jumping up to 360, it just becomes a negative number. And so I've got some really nice looking plots coming directly off both the IMU and the GPS. And so I had a plot here that showed the, the original IMU, the original GPS, and then the ones that I've unwrapped them to give me nice, nice looking values. So when I drove around the circle twice, the, the GPS comes back and it's pointing, it says it's pointing at 720 degrees, which is where it should be. That's, you know, around the circle twice gives you 360 times two. It's at 720, it says like 720.3 degrees or something. So that one is working. Again, I, I usually trust the GPS, so that seemed to be working. And the IMU after I drove around, and this was with no calibration on the IMU because I can't get that to work. This is the BNO 55 IMU. It drove around, it looked good the whole time. And when I got to the end, it was at 715 degrees. So it was off by five degrees after driving, what's that, 600 meters around the, around the loop twice. And I thought, well, those look pretty good. So what I did was that I, I fired up another plot, which you can't see, but I put the, the GPS and the IMU on top of each other. And they look almost identical, except for there's a couple spots where it turns out the GPS is actually wrong in two different places on the plot. And if I then I plotted down at the bottom, I plotted the, one of the covariance values from the GPS. And sure enough, that's a time when the GPS was wrong. The covariance values were not, they're, they're normally apparently supposed to be close to zero. And you can see there's a, a blip on the screen where it comes up. Well, here, let me, let me do this. As they say on uh, damage for hold on to your butts. I'm going to move the camera. Aha! We'll, we'll use this modern technology. So here's the uh, here's the, <laughs> so here, here's the plot of the uh, this is the GPS IMU or the the G, the GPS heading and the IMU heading on top of each other, and we'll just use the magical function to zoom in here. See if this works. Right, right. Right here, yeah, it's not going to focus if I do that. It's right there. One, one of them doesn't quite match. And then down at the bottom, here's the covariance values. And during that time, I had this bad covariance. And then over here, there's another another time when uh, it, it's actually bad right No, it's, I, over here. So it's actually bad right there. And you look down, and there's a bad covariance. Except if you zoom in, it turns out the, the bad covariance is here where they match. And when the covariance comes back, then the two don't match. So there, that, that's another issue you got to figure out why the covariance says it's good, but yet then the, the GPS plot is off. And then down at the end here, uh, this is where one is off by five degrees from the other one here, and you can't really tell on this plot. If this were a live, a live uh, view, I could drag this slider back and forth, and this red line would come over here to tell you what the two values are at that time. So what's the other... Uh, well, I can go back and show you the other ones now. Let me see what I have here. So there's what there. There's what my odometry looks like. It's supposed to be two overlapping rectangles, and it looks more like a clover leaf. And it turns out then if I take the numbers and run through Excel, I can get those to come out fairly, uh, fairly close to where they're they're supposed to be. So I just have to go back and put those numbers in. That's and, strange. 
And that, and that simply due to the tire pressure is why it did that. So I have to, number one, what I should do every time before I go run, check the tire pressure and make sure they're, they're right. And if I, I want both tires to be the same pressure and I want them to be at a known value. And then theoretically my, my, cal my calibration should come out fairly right. So this is a plot where the top line is just simply the velocity of the vehicle driving around. So at the very, very beginning here, I was at a speed of zero. And this is after I finished the score. The first time I came to a stop and sat there for a couple seconds. And then at the very end, I'm back at zero. And that's just showing, that's just so I could see what I was doing while I was driving around. So the center plot is the, uh, of two of the three covariance values. And I'm not sure how, how they differ, they differ, but so coming off the GPS zero, which is my RTK GPS, this is telling me that, you know, during this time over here and this time over here, I had uh, non-ideal covariance. And then down at the bottom is the, the flags out of the GPS. So this top line is, it's an RTK fix. It here drops to an RTK float. And at least one point during that, I dropped all the way to a single point fix. And you can see while it's in the float, that, that's where the covariance starts messing up here. And then, but here's another case where here the covariance isn't at zero, but it's still an RTK fix. So that's yet another thing to consider that, you know, even though it looks like they're good values, you can't trust them all the time. And this, this, I think, corresponds to a tree. So again, if I plot this next to my ground plot and take the slider and drag it around, I can see as it's going under a tree or past a tree, this is where it did this to me. And then the second time around the loop, this is the same spot, I think. So again, it dropped to a float and my covariance was, was, was looking nasty at that point. So it's just a way to find out, you know, can I, can I look at the covariance and the, the flags at the same time? And yes, I can. And that's what it's telling me there. So what else? Uh, this, this was just simply a plot of the top is the requested steering angle. The bottom is the recovered steering angle, which uh, if I go to the trouble, I can scale the two together. I can, then I can offset them and put them on top of each other. And they, they both seem to follow each other fairly closely. And you can see the difference. If I do a step function on the steering, you can see the top line, the, the number sent to the RC servo will, will change. And then the bottom one has to catch up because the the servo isn't instantaneous. It takes a while for it Chef. to come across. Yes. Chef, uh, I was, uh, as you are getting the GPS data, uh, maybe something that will be useful is to get the amount of satellites that you are getting in a topic. So you can uh, plot the amount of satellites and signal uh, to, to those errors. I, I can do that, and the data, I do have all that data. When I plot it, they're just all over the place. It just looks like noise, basically, as I drive around. And it, it's really, it, I don't think that really is telling me a whole lot. I think it's better to get the data that comes out that says, um, you know, it tells me if I have a fix or a float, and then look at the co covariance. I think it's going to be a much better indication of what I have. The, the, what you're saying, the fix and the float uh, kind of signal? Yes, that, that tells me more information than knowing how many satellites I have because you know, satellites come and go, but that doesn't necessarily tell me a whole lot on the actual accuracy of what I have at the time. Uh, and that, I, that data I, is all stored. I've got that in bag files. I can plot that out, but I can't right now because I can't get that no, computer no, to, it's, to do anything. It's okay because uh, one of, one of uh, the uh, one of the things that I noticed that is that it's very sensitive to the amount of satellites uh, that uh, that you get. Uh, yes, and there there are other things you can look at. There's like horizontal dilution of precision, and there, there's lots of numbers you can look at. There, there's tons and tons of numbers from the GPS you can look at. I'm not sure how many of them are actually all that useful, and I, in general, I'm getting pretty good pretty good data right now, and. It's, it's something to look at another day, you know, once I get that far. So th this is back to the fact, this is just the, the rectangular plot with two overlapping rectangles. I think this is offset in meters, which you probably can't read it because of the way I'm doing this. And on the right again is that the odometry that should have been two overlapping rectangles, but looks more like a clover leaf. So then the other, the other plot I was trying to show was this one. So this is the one where the, the, the second plot here, the blue one, is the IMU heading coming out, and the bottom one is the, the dual antenna GPS heading. 
and see it's got that where that where it bangs back and forth with the uh, zero to three sixty thing. So I just wrote code to unwrap those. So the top one is the IMU. As I drive around, see I got rid of all this junk here, and I get a nice plot. And when I get to I think right here, it's it's all the way around the square and starts again. So it, it just continues on. So it would just if I just keep driving around in circles, say driving around left, the, the heading just keeps getting larger and larger and larger. At any point, I can just say mod 360 and it'll put it back into a reasonable range. So that it makes it much easier to view and much easier to compare. So th <coughs> this is where I'm just showing the IMU unwrapped and down here is the GPS heading unwrapped. I've got it so it does that automatically on the fly now. So it actually publishes that in a topic. So I don't have to go pull up Excel and do all this stuff to, to fix all that. So then when I had these two plots, it looked about the same. Then it, then I plotted this one where it showed the uh, the two on top of each other. And for whatever reason, those those look great. That That's the best I've seen the IMU, the BNO 55 IMU working. And I know I know for a fact it had no calibration data at all while I was doing this. And so I still haven't figured out how to get it, how to calibrate it and then start it up next time and have it be calibrated. But this is working. At this point, this seems to be working quite quite well. It's just, again, if it's not working well, it doesn't say, oh, by the way, this is wrong. So you don't know if you should trust. But all of the sensors work that way, except like on the, the GPS putting out that covariance. It could be the covariance says, here's the numbers you're getting, but no, don't really trust them. But now on, on the fact, the IMU, I don't know if it's putting out anything like that or not. So so that, that's what that stuff was doing. So let's see if I go back to, uh, let's go back to this mode. So that that's what that's what I ran a couple of weeks ago. Now the other thing was I was having problems with the uh, my remote control, and I decided that this this cheap uh, plastic e-stop switch that was on the remote control, it, it turns out that the uh, the contacts on it are kind of kind of goofy. Where if you look through the side there, you can see there's just a little. As this goes up now, you probably can't see that. You, you can see something going up down there. It's just a flat bar, and it's got yes, terminals on yes. both ends. So as you push yes. down the latches. It just connects this this screw to to this screw, so that makes contact. So if if you have a high current situation, say if you're driving a motor or something, this says it's rated up to 10 amps. That probably works. Uh, here, let's do this. <laughs> okay, so that probably works just fine. But when you uh, when you hook it up, just logic level signals. I think the contacts are just dirty enough that they're just noisy. So I re I replaced it with one of these. Let's do this. So here's the here's the original plastic one, and then here's the the little one. This is actually a, a metal one. It's got two sets of switches, and they're they're decent switches in the thing. So I replaced that on on my remote control, and this it's it's all metal, and it's got a real nice feel to it. So you can bang it all you want, and then on the, yes. the remote. I got the same the same one that you got in in your left hand. It's my stop uh, button in the tractor. Uh, this one or the the little one? Yes, that one. Yes. And depending on what you're doing with it, it, it I think it'll work fine for high power circuits. But if you're trying to feed it in logic level signals, then it, then it becomes a problem. Now you can probably put a big load resistor on it, which I didn't try that. I just simply replaced the one on here. I actually pulled pulled it out and put the you know, so the, so it's smaller in size now. So that that's actually better because it was kind of in the way when I was trying to run things. And so that I did that and I haven't had problems since I've done that, but I haven't really driven it a lot. So I got to keep an eye on that, see if that actually fixes my problem or not. And then, it, then if you want to make something really small, here's a, here's a smaller one that's, that's made out of plastic. So here's the, well, compared to the original one. So here's the original plastic one. And then this is a little one that I found. Uh, I don't, it might've come from MPJA or I might've bought it on, on eBay. But it's got a. Uh, it's it seems to have a decent switch. This has just got one one switch, whereas the other one has two sets of switches. So I plan to take the one of the two sets of switches. And the way I did it on the back of my robot, I've got the one set of switches just tied to a red green LED. So if the switch is up or down, it's just the red the LEDs are red or green, so I can instantaneously know is that switch turned off or not. So I I was thinking I might rebuild a remote control and make it smaller. So I just. Just for the, the heck of it, I bought these little tiny uh, joysticks. They're little thumb joysticks. And if you buy it with the, uh, if you, you can buy them on a board because the problem is the, uh, the, the pins coming out of the back of these things are all metric 
on metric centers. They 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 will not plug into a tenth inch uh, perf board. So if you buy it on a board like that, then it's got the pins there you can hook onto. <laughs> I may have a hard time with this being backwards like this, but anyway, anyway, I got this board. There was like like six boards for eight dollars or something. So they're 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 really cheap, and it basically it's just just like the big big ones. It's just got two potentiometers on here. It's actually got a switch, so if you push down on it, the switch clicks. But that's a problem because if you wiggle it at all and your vehicle lurches while well, you're trying to push the switch, your vehicle lurches. They, it's probably best not to use those the switches, the push button switch on that. So I was thinking if you had the little the little e stop and the a uh, couple of the little uh, thumb joysticks, you can make just a little thing about the size of a a gamepad controller. So that's something else. I've I've been collecting parts to do that. So on to the next thing. I got the uh, I did get the uh, Adafruit um, B and O eighty five module, and I've got that hooked up, and it does indeed talk. I can't get that to work with the Adafruit software because they've done something. They they got a little too little too clever, and they put an extra layer on top of their I squared C, and it doesn't work anymore. At least it doesn't work on a Teen C, and I can't figure out how to fix it. So I'm just I'm just using the Spark Fun code to do that. And actually, I bought two of the two of the sensors. So here's the other one, and it's got one of those uh, quick cables on. The quick cable actually came from uh, came from Spark Fun when I bought something else. And I, what was odd was I, I I took this one, I soldered the pins on it, plugged in my proto board, and I went to turn it around because it was, you know, I thought it was backwards. So when I went to pull it out, it turns out you know the pins are supposed to be soldered straight down out of the thing like this, and for some reason they were they were like this when I got them soldered in. Well, apparently I plugged them in the wrong row of holes, put the board on and soldered it down so the, the pins are all screwed up. So I just simply stuck stuck it in a board and started prying on it. I was able to bend the pins enough that it plugs, it plugs straight into something. So that's something that's happened a, a lot of, to me because I'm a pretty shitty solder. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then I figured this one, uh, since I don't know what orientation it's going to have to actually be right now or when it's done, it's got the screw holes, so I could. Just, just drill holes in my piece of plastic and screw this right down and, and have, and they aren't symmetrical. So I'm gonna have to have a set of holes like that and a set of holes like that in order to get all four uh, directions on that. But that that should work out. So I found out that, what's that? I, 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 got, it, I got them with the, I don't know how to say the zip locks, the, to attach them, the, the precintos, the, I don't know how to say. But I, I, with wires, I, I use the holes and I put wires uh, because uh, I have the same problem that, that you are mentioned. And I always solder. Uh, I, I, you don't know if you're going to go upwards or backwards. Yeah. And then I found out I'm using the same same code that, that Al is running right now. So this board on here, I think. I think the LEDs on this end of the board. So I think if you point it this way, like this, then I think this become ah, this 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 becomes east. I think if you if you do this, and it turns out so if you run the Spark Fun code, it says that's zero degrees, and then if I rotate it to be north, that says plus ninety degrees, which I think is what Ross wants to see if you're publishing that as an odometry uh, odometry message. So I think that works directly for Ross, if you just convert that into an odometry message and publish it, that should be correct. But what I want to do, since I, uh, since my other sensors put out zero to 360 and they, they say north is zero, mm -hmm. I want to convert the output of this so I can plot it on top of the other stuff there. And I, I, tr I played with that a couple of times and can't. So far, I haven't got it to work, but I've got some other ideas on how to make it do that. And I thought, well, maybe just that code that converts the quaternion to Euler in the uh, the Spark Fun code, it turns out that the, the Adafruit library does exactly the same thing. They read the quaternion and convert it to Euler, Euler angles, and their code's slightly different. But I thought, well, maybe that is simply the order they're doing it in makes east zero and makes north 90. And I started looking at it. It turns out if you actually plot out the quaternion from this thing, so if I got this thing set up and I pointed east, and look at the actual quaternion, if it's pointed east, it says 0001, which means it really thinks that east should be zero degrees. So that I, I was looking at some more stuff and there's two ways. I think there's something that says you can change the orientation of a sensor. 
think you can send it a command and say, well, no, rotate the whole thing 90 degrees internally. So maybe I can get it that way to say north is zero degrees. And that, that'll, that'll keep me happier on that, on that front. And then the other thing is I, it's got that tear command. So you can say, you know, point at the direction you want and say, well, no, really make this zero degrees instead of something else. So if I just simply point it north and do the tear command and say, that's really zero degrees that I think, I think that will make north at zero degrees. So for my testing, I think that will come out the way I want it. Otherwise, I'm going to do things like, I figure if it's going uh, plus and minus 180 is what the, the, the stock code is putting out. And I thought, well, I, what I can do, I, I tried just subtracting 90 from that to get it to rotate around so, so north would be right. And it starts off at zero and comes around to 270, and it starts over at zero again. So that, that, that wasn't quite right. So I think if I say, take the value coming in, and if it's negative, just simply uh, add 360 to it. And I think that'll give me my, my zero to 360, but that does not correct for the, the problem of east versus north. And then the direction would be wrong too. So if I multiply the result by minus one, that'll change the rotation direction. So I, I still have some more playing around I have to do there to, to get that to come out. So my thought is I'll get this bolted on, dump the numbers out, and then um, I want to try plotting this on top of my other two heading references to see how well this is going to act, see if, it, see if, see if it's going to be stable while I drive it around, and then I, I still I, I still can't get the calibration to work right. I know Al said, oh, I use that document. It just worked great. Well, on mine, I go through the document. It says, it says, it says point it this way and then rotate it this way and then do the. It tells me various things to do. And none of that seems to work. Every once in a while, the number would change a little bit. So finally, I just get frustrated. I just take it. I just I start going like this. And it says, OK, I'm calibrated now. So I that that's the condition it's in right now, which is closer than it was when I first started. So. So there, there's more issues there to figure out. So that, that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm, I'm playing with this new IMU. I've swapped out my e-stop switch. The old IMU looks like it's working much better than I've seen it working. And other than that, I can't think, think what I've been working on. So, oh, oh, one more thing. So it turns out, and let's see, this is on the right computer. So let's say if I go, if I go here and pull up this one. Let me see, share this one. And screen one, no, I want, well, let's do screen one and then close these down. So You're here, here is a program. This shows you the, um, what they call geodetic monuments that are located in the Minneapolis area. And what it is, it's a, uh, here, let me zoom out a little farther. And you can see these things are all over the place. So if they put in a bridge or they put in, some of these are the intersection of two highways, which don't do a lot of good because you can't walk out in the middle of the highway to check this. But the point is, if I pull up one of these, this one's uh, fairly close to my house here. It's like a few blocks away. Yeah, that's real handy. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll, we'll look at it like that, I guess. So it says, this is the, the ID number. It's called 2710B. And somewhere it says it's an aluminum rod driven in the ground. And um, so if you pull up the data sheet, let me see if I can quickly find the data sheet here. I think it's this one. No, it's the wrong one. Oh, come on. Cancel that. Let me let me go back. Ah. Okay, so I'll just randomly grab another one here and see if I can get the right one. That's probably not the right one either. Yeah, this is the right one. So let me let me let me pull this one back up. And get this crap out of the way. Let's put it over there. So it says here's the 2710B. And it says where it's located. Here's latitude and longitude. And it was put in in the year 2015. And there's 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 lots of stuff here I don't understand. It says it's a an alloy metal rod that's 12 feet long. So they they drove a, a 12 foot stake directly into the ground, straight down. 
and then they monitor it somewhere it says they, they checked it with GPS. So they so they, they come up with the, this latitude and longitude from a GPS marker and they the, so they put these in and then they they supposedly uh, keep track of these over the years so it's supposed to be right. And then down here they give you pictures. So let me pull up a picture of not that one. This one? No, that's my lawn tractor. <laughs> so unfortunately, well, let me pull on the door here. This is the other one that was uh, was my come back here. That's this one over here. And this this would be a real nice one because it's easy to get to and um, well, I do here. Let me go back to my story here. Uh, da, 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 da. What was I doing? Oh, I was going to pull up pictures. So here's this picture, and it says it's just a uh, this this uh, thing stuck in the ground. And here's a post here saying this is a geodetic marker. Don't touch it. Well, since they put this in, they. Uh, Google Maps shows that they ran a fence along this area right here. So it's about a three foot high chain link fence just to keep people from walking from the sidewalk into this property here. And then it turns out what I went over this time, this three foot chain link fence with a about an eight foot tall metal, uh, metal grape fence with big spikes on top to keep people from climbing over. And the reason for that is because the property right here happens to be the, the Minneapolis uh, fire and police union hall. So, yeah, that would have been a perfect target during the uh, during the George Floyd trial. So they put up this fence around it, and they've also got a, a gate on it, so you can't get in there. So basically, this is this is fenced in, and I can't get to it anymore. I can get on the sidewalk here, and I can get right about here. So I can put up a tripod here and use a tape measure to measure over to it and measure it that way. So let's see. Here's the. Uh, so here's what it looks like. It's just a, they've got this plastic um, casing stuck in the ground and then they filled it full of gravel. And here's that, that stake that's a, the, the other one was 12 foot long. I don't know how long this one is. I can't really tell if I look at the picture. So you zoom in here. Just by looking at it, you can't really tell what that is. It turns out like a three quarter inch diameter uh, aluminum rod that's driven straight down in the ground. And then they put this big disc on it here to, uh, to, to identify the thing. See how to get back now. And the disc looks like that. So here's the, here's the metal rod. And somewhere it says, I think they drilled a hole in the, in the aluminum, put a bar magnet in there. So if you try to pick it up with a magnet, you can go across, you know, if it's buried on the ground, you can find it that way. So this is just telling you in 2014, they put this in and this is the ID mark on the thing. So that's what it's supposed to look like. Now it turns out the one that I, I found, the one that's close to me, I found it, but they redid the road two or three years ago, and, and the thing is busted up. So the, the the cap is missing off the thing, so you can't just open it and have a nice clean thing. Like that. And it looks like it was pulled up several inches, and either some heavy equipment bent the rod. This is a three-quarter inch rod, and it's bent. And then it looks like they've hit it with a lawnmower a few times, but it still looks like it's close enough. If I pull up the... In the old, in the older times, <clears throat> the people that do the the surveys maps, they use that. They I, I don't know how uh, it's like steel point where they go to synchronize the their equipment because they are sure which are the coordinates there. Yeah, so that, that that's the whole point of this. They went through, they put these in the ground, and then they've got I can go to the website and get pull up the information on it. So this is the actual one that I that I found close to my house. And see it's I put it in 2015, and here's the ID number, and here's the, the metal rod. Well, it turns out, let's see, can I do this? So it, when they put it in 2015, it looked like this, where you can see the, the, the plastic is actually sticking up above the ground and they didn't put in the, the metal sign saying this is a geodetic marker, don't touch it. And so somewhere along the line, either when they're rebuilding the road, they either ran some heavy equipment across it and it broke the broke the top off. And then the metal rod is sticking out at a stupid angle. So it, but, but the fact that I can get to, let's 
uh, that's wrong one. The fact that I can get to this, I know it's basically in the center of the, the thing because the casing is still there. It's just the top is all broken up. So I can see where the rod comes up out of the middle. So if I just put my tripod over the top of that and just line it up with the center of this thing, that should be close enough to tell me where it's got to be. Because the whole point is I've never verified my Jeep how accurate it is compared to anything else. So if I put my tripod over the top of this, and turn it on and say, tell me where that location is and feed a correction data from the State Department of Transportation. It's their data and their survey marker. So theoretically, I can find out how far, you know, my off by a centimeter or two centimeters or six feet or whatever. So that that's the whole point of that. So sometime next week, I want to go out and, and try that and see, see what I can do. Uh, that's, I don't know the, the word in English for that, but that's, that was very common 20 years ago, as now the, the survey engineers got the RTK, they don't use it anymore. I assume they still use these because they're maintaining this on their website. And I, I, haven't, I haven't found any new ones, but it looks like every time they put in a bridge, they'll put in one of these markers, they'll, they'll stick it in the concrete. And so there's a few few more places in town. If I know where they're at, I can just go to say walk down the sidewalk on a bridge, and there'll be a marker there. I could I could check that. But a lot of them are right in the intersection of two two streets, so it's out in the middle of the road. So I'd have to go walk on the middle of the road, pull the cap off, and and do that. So I, I don't really don't really want to try that. So I but yes. I'm assuming. Yes. But I but it, it sounds like what they've done is they verified where this is using RTK GPS. And that's, so that's why the numbers should, should all match if I can find one and check it. Oh, because when you use the, the RTK GPS, you have, you have to go through a process that you have to stick to a point like that. So uh, the more points that you have like that one, the more uh, situations you have to get better information because the RTK is essentially uh, something like this. I am here and the satellite is telling that I'm two meters to the right, but I'm here. So do the correction. That's the, the main thing. So the, the most uh, uh, points you have with correction in, in floor to put your, your antenna there is the best. And it's much better for the altitude because maybe it's not uh, so difficult to get uh, good information from a space, but the altitude, it's always very bad. And the other thing is, um, since the RTK should give me an absolute position, I should be able to go there and it should say, yes, you are at this latitude and longitude that they specify. And the other thing, just a couple of years ago, they upgraded the correction data coming from the Minnesota Department of Transportation. The old stuff would put out GPS and GLONASS, and now they've added, now they have, you can get GPS, GLONASS, and Galileo. So I can, I can turn those on and off and see if that affects my, my position too. I have problems uh, with the signal of Galileo, but I never got problems with the signal of GLONASS. Um, um, the GPS network, uh, but the problem is not my equipment. The problem is that the Galileo satellites sometimes are not working. Maybe it's something uh, about South America, uh, but it's very constant. And I haven't really tracked over time to see you know, do I have a lot of satellites or is there certain times of the day when I don't? So I haven't really looked at that. I just, I turn it on, I seem to get good results. So I haven't done a lot of, a lot of research into that, but that'd be something else. You know, now that I have, if I, if I can say this tells me, yes, that reference point is exactly where they say it is and then turn correction data on and off or turn satellites on and off, that'd be another thing I could verify. Because if I turn enough satellites off, I can make the F9P, uh, do faster calculations and I could get say a 10 Hertz update rate somewhere. It says if you, if you only run GPS, you can get a 20 Hertz update rate coming out of the thing. But I think if you possibly you have to only run two constellations, you can get 10 Hertz. And I think if you run three, I can possibly get eight Hertz. So it, it, it'd be interesting to see, you know, if I turn satellites off, turn off the say, don't even look at the satellites and then don't use the correction data 
that's trying to do that. So that that's more more things I can try just to see what just to see what I can get out of it. Uh, you know that I didn't think that uh, about the one of the things that I was reading uh, and trying to understand much better was about the rate and the hertz in the topics. Uh, and I didn't think what you're saying, that uh, if you get uh, too much information about the other satellites, you are over overriding the, the, the data that's going out of the GPS because you are getting too much information. There is a chart somewhere that I can never find, but it's in one of their manuals and it says if you're running GPS only, you can run at 20 hertz. If you're running GPS and one of the constellations, I think it says you can run 10 hertz. And then if you've got three constellations, you can run eight hertz. And if you try to run four or more, you have to run at five hertz update rate. And mine is set to five hertz because I didn't want to try to figure all that out and, and fight with it. But it, but it's simply the matter. You, you got way more information. The more satellites you add, you got way more information. It just doesn't have enough processing power to, to do them all at the same time and do the fast rate. So there's some trade-offs there. As I understand, one of the difference between maybe the my chipset uh, is that the processing is in the in the board, and, uh, and it's delivered to the raw system, the data processing. Uh, but that that things that I don't want to enter because I think that that's a rabbit hole. Yeah, I, I've forgotten you've got the other receiver. You've got the Swift Av Pixie. Yes. And that one, yeah. I think when, when I was playing with one of those at work, I think we had it set to 10 hertz, and I think it was happy, but I don't recall now. Now, it could be it's got the same options where if you turn turn on certain satellites and turn off other ones, maybe you can run it faster, but I I, I don't know. I, I'd say if you've got got a setting that works, maybe stick with it. And I think we were running that at 10 hertz and it was happy, but. Yes, 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 you can do all, the, all that kind of things because, but as I understand that that was solved by the software uh, inside the board, uh, um, the board received the, I think that the Baidu, the GLONASS, the Galileo and the GPS and mixed them in one signal that is forward to the robot. Yes, it, it automatically merges all those together to give you one, one final solution. But you do have the yes. option, if you want to, you could turn off Galileo completely, and it, it may be more stable, or it may yes. allow you to run faster. I, I, don't, I, I don't know. I work. Uh, I, work uh, I turn it uh, down Galileo because I have a lot of problems. Uh, I do. I only use GLONASS and GPS. Okay, gents, um, quick update on my side. Um, still trying to get out into the field to test the IMU. Had trouble with my network setup. Um, thought it was my, the fact that I had um, updated my laptop to Ubuntu 20. Uh, you may recall, I have this tincture GUI that displays my... Your uh, AP? Yeah, I have a, a GUI that I wrote to help launch the files and display things like the angle setting and different things. And I think that, I thought that was the problem. Ultimately, I just realized that I had a network set up problem um but ended up rewriting the gui so i posted some of the code for that i'm on my phone otherwise i'd show you show you that so, and then after after you update the code you understand that there was a problem of the new world yeah my uh, vpn is um, a little bit screwed up so i'm still dealing with i'm I sort of take one step forward and one step back. So um, I'm going to strip off the VPN and go to sort of straight programming static IP addresses and hopefully get out uh, and test The only thing that I found out that was suitable for me was that 
because I got this problem that I think that maybe you are in the same page. I was, uh, when I was trying to update my packages and try, I need to, to, uh, to plug the tractor to my network. But when you are working in the field, you don't need to, to, to uh, you have to, to get your, your own network by the tractor. So the best thing that I found out was to plug the, the tractor through a LAN cable um, uh, and through the, the LAN cable uh, and put a, a, a switch there. I'm not. I'm not sure if I'm able to to explain myself. But no, I, I, I think. I mean, I, I generally, I think I understand what you're saying. Because it was the only way. Because you need to work with the tractor, but the tractor and your computer got to get the same IP, uh, being the same network. Uh, so that's something that I didn't found out a very uh, suitable way to solve. Yeah, zero tier VPN has worked flawlessly for me up until recently. And I think it's, I, I think the fact that the tractor is sitting on Ubuntu 16.04, I think something has gotten updated that zero tier doesn't like 16.04. And um, I'm not able to uninstall it and reinstall it. And um, I think I'm. I think the fact that it's on 1604 is catching up with me. Um, so I don't think I'm going to be able to use zero tier VPN anymore. And we'll have to just. No, it's that something. Uh, that's something about a, a configuration because I use zero tier a lot. Uh, through this year, I have to use it externally because of the pandemic and bring services to the, my office and my brother's office. And always the problems, when I have problems, were my uh, fault. Not about a zero tier not being able to work with Ubuntu. One of the best things of, about zero tier is it's that very useful in Ubuntu, Windows, the phones. And maybe when you update it, what it got and uninstalled. Well, my my specific issue is I can't execute any zero tier commands without getting a segmentation fault error, and I can't uninstall it and reinstall it. And I get getting error the, messages the, the, about Ubuntu. Advantage file can't be found, um, and so it's um, to me it's smelling like a, a software versioning issue, um, and so I'm just gonna like try to work around the fact that I've, I'm going to stop trying to use, I don't absolutely have to have a VPN and um, I want to test the IMU and, <laughs> and I don't need the VPN absolutely and we'll try to figure something else out. <laughs> so, and I'm not thrilled about the idea of reinstalling Ubuntu um, because then I would have to reinstall the um, I would have to reinstall this the uh, all the, the packages. Uh, Ross packages and uh, Benny showed me how to do the development version of move base and i'm like oh my gosh i don't really want to have to figure that out again um yes it's something that we are all always start because when you are trying to to move something between one system and the other 
you get stuck with the network issues that you are uh, you, that you are saying. That was one of the main things that I love Docker because when you get the that the Docker image working right, you can pull it again and again and again, and you get and you will get the same system. It's not yeah. for you now, and I don't want to put it in another uh, problem. But the things that I'm so fanatic about Docker are that kind of things because it's very discouraging when you are trying to, to, to improve something and when you touch something, the all, all the other things broke. So I, I, I feel the same that you are feeling. Yeah, so it's all pluses and minuses, I guess. Yes. So, but I am I am happy that um, even though I'm not thrilled by why I had to do it, um, I do think I'm happy with the GUI that I have and the the ability to display um, some topics on the operator operator laptop while the tractor is running i think that'll be really really helpful while i'm um, testing the heading and, and different stuff so um a lot of that codes out on the google drive or or someplace that you guys can see and i'll walk through that when i've got my uh, when i'm not on my phone like i am today okay so that's what's going on on my side okay is, is there is, is, is this somebody more? Oh no, we are we are only three. So uh, it's been a pleasure to see both again. And the, I will do my best to be next week again here. Good deal, Jeff. Anything else before we break? Uh, I can't think of anything. Juan, anything else? No, thank you. Guys, I'm going to hopefully stop recording. I think it'll work fine, and, uh, and uh, I'll post it a little bit later. Have a great weekend. Okay. Have a great weekend. Bye. Ciao. Okay, bye. Ciao.